Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to this conversation about NFTs and the art world. I am Kate Levin from Bloomberg Philanthropies, and I am joined by an extraordinary group of people. Nina Del Rio, who is vice chair of Sotheby's Advisory Services, Simon Denny, who is an artist and the co-founder of the Berlin Program for Artists and a professor at HFBK Berlin. Uh, Hamburg. Hamburg. Hamburg, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, correct the app. Mm -hmm. um, Paula Crown, who is an artist and uh, a principal of Henry Crown and & Company, and uh, we are very grateful that she is also a member of the advisory group for uh, the Aspen Institute Arts Committee. And Nicola Leeds, who is the Nancy and Bob Magoon Director of the Aspen Art Museum. So uh, today our conversation uh, is about NFTs, and we are going to focus uh, not so much on the how, but really on the why. Why are NFTs causing such a stir? Um, by way of very brief definition, uh, non-fungible tokens are a, a means of conveying digitized information through encrypted blockchain technology that establishes ownership and creation uh, as these assets uh, can be uh, traded and sold. So doesn't sound like something that would uh, create such a huge stir in the art world. Um, they are essentially a new asset class, uh, new really in the past year and a half, but the excitement and consternation and confusion that they're causing have made it pretty clear that they are also a real critique of the art world in many respects. Who gets to buy art? Uh, how is artistic value determined? Is there a difference between artistic value and artistic merit? Why are artists perceived as creators but not economic agents? And who stewards the public interest in the art world? So the status and impact of NFTs are evolving as we speak. So I think the one thing that we can promise is that this is not a definitive conversation. Um, but again, it is a conversation that engages some of the most uh, interesting people and leaders in the art world. And I would just also say, beyond being a kind of niche, although amazing, conversation uh, about the arts, I think this may have um, a uh, bigger significance just because while it's rarely acknowledged, the arts are often at the center of so many conversations about other things that signify. If you think about the tracks at uh, this wonderful edition of the Aspen Ideas Festival, beauty for sure, but also money, power, trust, connection, um, all uh, often circulate around uh, art and uh, artists. So the fundamental goal of our conversation is going to be to offer some per perspectives on a few things through the lens of NFTs. Why people want things, what power we give the people who make the things we love, and in what ways our ownership tied to belonging. So I am going to ask Nina to start us off by giving us a little bit of context from her perspective about the uh, eruption of NFTs in the art market. I like that word, eruption. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here. It's so much fun to be at the Aspen Institute. So I was thinking about this question yesterday and this morning, you know, how did we at Sotheby's, and Sotheby's which is so in the art market, and I in my career, what do I do? I've, I've worked in the art market my entire career. I have the great pleasure of working with museums and large public entities, cultural entities, so how am I here? How did I end up talking about NFTs? Well, in fact, we started paying attention when we saw Christie's in March of 2021 sell a work by Beeple for $69 million, that got our attention. I don't wanna make this all about money and there are so many sort of deeper concepts here, but it was definitely the commercial opportunity that got our attention. I'm watching it, you know, if 2020 is the year of digital transformation and sales in the art marketplace essentially moving from live to online, 2021 is the year of turning your head and saying, oh my gosh, what is an NFT and what does it mean to the art market? So if that starts in March of 2021, by April, we have gotten into the market. We're sort of looking at Christie's and we're seeing, and we're, we're, we're feeling a little uncomfortable here. You know, what is our role? We are not eBay. 
I'm sitting here listening to Simon, who's incredibly articulate about what it means to be an artist. So here we are, we're a marketplace. What does it mean to sell NFTs? And I'll, I'll tell you why, I'm gonna fast forward because we only have 39 minutes, but I'll tell you why it really caught our attention. Let's put the financial opportunity aside, though in 2021, we at Sotheby's sold $100 million in NFTs. That's unheard of. In 2022, by the way, we've sold about $4 million. There's a huge change in this marketplace. So what did we see that was meaningful to us? First of all, we were working with artists directly. So we're a secondary marketplace. We work with sellers who've already bought something. We don't actually have the opportunity to work with artists directly. And all of a sudden, we saw that as a new sort of way for us to have, I don't want to call it impact, but a little bit of a curatorial lens. So that has, it's sort of a double-edged sword, and we have to be really careful about that. We also saw the opportunity in smart contracts. So what is a smart contract? All it means is that the transaction protocol, and we're really looking at it from the transaction perspective, the art transaction is dictated at the time of inception. So it could be dictated by the artist. It could be dictated by a museum. It could be dictated in part by us. But it means that every time that work sells, you could think about royalties going back to the seller. And once you start to think about that, there's real meaning in disruption to the art market. Because right now, you sell a work of art, and it could be sold 10 more times, but you won't actually participate in that resale. And so when we started to see the door open of, wow, we could work with artists, we could participate ourselves in the resale of works, but we could also participate, make sure our partners, our partners were museums, our partners are artists themselves, our partners are other sellers, make sure that there's this lively royalty, so philanthropic artist resale, all those you know, going back to the original seller. And I would say the third sort of point that really got our attention, which continues is, wow, was this a different demographic? So if, if we saw our markets, you know, in 2020, we all looked at each other and we said, okay, how do we keep our markets going? Other art sellers had essentially pressed the pause button, galleries stopped, art fairs stopped, even our competitors and auction houses had to stop. We, for no sort of forethought, but we had actually laid our, our technology infrastructure many years before, we were able to pivot quickly. And we said to ourselves, how were we going to sustain this market? And we expanded into lots of different categories, but we started to see a different demographic, a younger demographic in the traditional art world. Turn to NFTs in 2021, and something like 78% of our buyers are under 40 years old. We could talk about like what does that mean and where are those buyers coming from and the sort of specula speculation in the market, which is very real, and I won't get too cynical until someone asks me a question. But that kind of age group and the majority of buyers being new to us, we saw, wow, okay, this is a huge door opener, at least for our organization, for the art world in general, start to sort of bring some transparency and disintermediation to this world. So lots of meaningful threads that I think will, will very much carry forward, even though the market is kind of tippy at the moment. So thank you so much for setting that context. I wanna now ask Nicola to weigh in as a representative of an institution, and an institution particularly positioned because you're not a collecting institution, but what has the advent of NFTs meant to you, and how is your institution thinking it should uh, proceed vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this new art form? I think it's, it's been so interesting, and as you said, Kate, I mean, we are a non-collecting institution, so, and an artist-founded institution, which are the two most important things about the Aspen Art Museum. So from our perspective, we don't maybe have some of the conflicts of interest that other institutions have that have collections and are being looked at to help have a conversation around value, per se. We're really about what it means for artists to occupy a new space, and particularly, as Simon said, potentially a new movement. So for us, um, we, I think all institutions have had a slightly slower approach to the auction houses, which is really fascinating. I think um, speed has been something that has um, been part of the surprise of the NFTs, because um, 
it works in a very different way to the traditional art world. And as an institution, what can we offer this space? And I think some of that has to be around support. Some of it has to be around translating a medium to a new audience. And the most exciting thing, talking to artists about this, it was Simon Denny's traveled a long way to come and join us and um, talk to us about this. We also have an incredible artist at the museum at the moment called Ian Chang, who is definitely occupying a whole space of his own in this digital world. And I think for us, it is really important that we're looking and thinking through how this could be exhibitions, this could be research projects, this could be a space for commissioning. And my background really is also wanting to take risks with artists and sit in this sort of space of the unknown and, and a space of experimentation. And I think this world is certainly um, a space of the unknown at the moment. And the, the last thing is that I think it's interesting for us to think, who do we partner with? Because um, that's a big question. And actually, a lot of the self-organized movements are by artists. So we're interested also in these DAOs, and maybe we could collaborate with some DAOs, or also think through how we can also try and connect to these more virtual institutions that are kind of coming together in, on different digital platforms. So we don't necessarily, th we're not necessarily thinking about making NFTs at this point. We might look at that space, but we're wanting to think through about how we can be a support structure for artists and also make new material that goes alongside this work. Um, and for us, the artists that I'm interested in are the artists that are maybe looking at this as a medium and talking to the medium, whether it's through the economic structures or the legal structures. I mean, there's great precedent in art history now, and I think this crypto winter is enabling us to sort of connect a bit more. All of these things that have happened in the last 18 months more to, you know, the kind of history of digital art, the history of... Um, conceptual art as well, with Seth Z. Blau also having a huge interest in trying to develop these artists' contracts that could be universal. So this, you know, the conversations, is this the end of conceptual art or is it the beginning of a new movement? And obviously, the, nothing ends. But um, so for us, it's exciting to see where this is going to sit in art history and how we can be a participant in that future. You, you've staked such a leadership claim in general to being a support for artists, that it's a great transition to the fact that we get to center uh, a conversation about the arts in the marketplace, shockingly, with two amazing artists. Mm -hmm. So, um, Paula, I'm, I, I'd like to turn to you now. Your practice is extraordinarily fearless in undertaking to use and examine new kinds of media, new kinds of fabrication. Um, you haven't yet stepped into the NFT world, though, so mm -hmm. would love to hear from you. What are you thinking about it? Are you considering it, uh, what are the concerns that you have around NFTs? Great, thank you, Kate. I, I'm in research mode. Um, I, I've been thinking about this for a period of time. There's so many pluses. One is the ownership certification is really important. The um, idea of smart contract and that you can have a percentage of subsequent transactions, which we know a lot of art, uh, artists have suffered from not having. Uh, a piece of the action or, or royalty. You have new channels, you have new audiences. All of that's super exciting. Now, all that doesn't happen without a lot of work, which uh, Simon and I were talking about before. Um, that, that takes a different focus of, of, of one's um, artistic energies. The, the concerns, the uncertainty, is this is an unregulated market. It's an opaque market. There is not a lot of discernment in the market. It's speculative. So I'm, once again, just gathering information and, and figuring out the, ne the next moves. For me, the, um, the reason why I make art is so I can get a space to think about ideas and how to translate those ideas in different ways. You know, art, art's a language. And at, at time is the most important thing that, that we all have. We live in an environment where our time and our attention is fractured. I choose to be really intentional in my practice to not be distracted. I am sure that there will be support systems for NFTs and, and artists going forward. Right now, um, I 
haven't been as courageous and insightful as Simon uh, in this, but um, I'm gonna know more after this talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paula. So Simon, you are in the thick of this. I think you've been using blockchain since 2018. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, yeah. there's been many preambles to that as yeah. well. I've made a lot of art about uh, crypto and about the kind of social things and political things that come up mm -hmm. through the emergence of crypto. But yeah. so, 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 talk to us a little bit about that journey. Why is this of interest to you? Mm -hmm. And um, I can share one of my favorite headlines um, ever <laughs> uh, about uh, your work. Um, only Artnet can get away with this kind of headline for those of us uh, who are journalism fans. Simon Denny is selling an intentionally lackluster NFT to benefit institutions crypto collectors typically don't care about. Um, <laughs> it was about a year ago uh, regarding an NFT that you made for the Basel Art Fair. But um, tell us about your journey and yeah. what it's like to be intentionally lackluster. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's, yeah. Uh, I just want to say that also uh, all of the things that have been said so far resonate with a lot. Um, uh, so um, it's such a pleasure to be here also at the Aspen uh, Institute. And actually, my journey uh, also kind of starts with something that resonates a great deal with this place and that I've been looking at um, for the longest time in my work, uh, the way technologists tell stories about the world, right? That's the, my, my core interest, the kind of stories that are told by technologists that, that we kind of all hear and kind of take on to a certain extent. And, um, and when crypto emerged, there were these new stories being told about like what value was, what money was, and I was like, wow, that's so interesting. So I went into um, following that since 15, 16, uh, made some installations and museums um, and biennales. Uh, so the Berlin Biennale, I made an exhibition there that dealt with that, uh, the, the Serpentine Galleries in London um, and uh, some other places too. Uh, Hammer Museum in LA had a, had a, had a, had a piece as well. Um, but then I also got to know other artists who, I, who weren't really on my radar, who were making art with it as a medium, right? So they were using smart contracts, designing smart contracts, thinking about networked assets, thinking about what an, a networked ownership of, uh, of digital files could mean as a medium. Uh, and so I also got into kind of curating um, as well uh, at that stage because nobody was really doing that, uh, that that was in my little art world. Um, so I made an exhibition in 2018 called Proof of Work, which is named after the core Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum protocol for consensus uh, mechanisms. And uh, I worked with groups like uh, Terra Zero, who are using smart contracts to design uh, ways that trees can own themselves. You know, this is something you can't do. Uh, in other ways, very, very interesting project um, uh, that is gonna be part of the Carnegie International this year, actually. Uh, and um, also, uh, I got to know people like Harm van der Dorpel, who had been working in the space for a really long time, who was designing projects where digital assets that you bought could change. So you could buy it, uh, and one of the claims uh, in, in the blockchain world is that art, artworks can be permanent, but he's designed the code so that the assets actually change how they look over time. So that's a very interesting thing uh, as well. And I got to know other artists um, like Sarah Friend uh, uh, as well, who is using the network as a medium as well, designing um, uh, NFTs that expire after three months, uh, that they'll, they'll kind of delete themselves unless you pass them on to other wallets. So, uh, so it's kind of uh, about sharing rather than, than hoarding. Um, and then I got very uh, interested and in, in started making my own experiments, like the one uh, with the um, uh, with the uh, Basel Kunsthalle, like you mentioned, uh, which was um, selling an economic chart, a JPEG of an economic chart uh, of increasing housing prices um, and then donating uh, uh, the proceeds to the Swiss uh, um, uh, state uh, as a kind of a, a, a wealth transfer from, um, from crypto to uh, fiat money, like a kind of a backwards uh, move there. And I also designed uh, a project recently called Dotcom Seance, uh, which I did with... Um, the artist uh, who did the early CryptoKitties experiment, one of the first very successful NFTs. Uh, we did a collaboration where we tried to resurrect Web1 companies, so dot-com uh, companies in Web3, uh, so take ones that died in 2001 and bring them back um, in Web3. Uh, companies like cashwars.com and financialprinter.com and uh, bring them back to life through designing new logos of them and also using uh, ENS domains, um, so that's like a a DNS domain, like a website. I have simondenny.com, but I also have simondenny.eth on my wallet. And I bought a bunch of uh, uh, domains that you could then uh, design uh, companies on. And uh, 
I'm, I'm happy to say funbug.eth, uh, which we uh, resurrected, <laughs> one, of, one of the early um, uh, dot-com failures uh, by the guy that then went on to do, um, uh, 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 what is it, GoPro? Uh, we're, we're bringing that company back to life, and uh, an artist is now designing a whole new gaming platform uh, on the top of uh, funbug.eth. Uh, so it's this very interesting way of uh, bringing back the history of the internet in and of itself. I don't know. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> Well, that, that, that's extraordinary, and I think part of what it gets at is the, the, the meeting of artistic creativity and a marketplace that often tries to, uh, I think, take the assets art artists make, um, but leave them uh, behind at that point. I, I, I want to sort of take this moment to, to beef about uh, the, the fact that the U.S. tax code, if an artist makes a donation to a museum, the artist can only uh, deduct the value of the materials. If a collector donates to an art museum, they get to uh, deduct the full market value of the work. The reasons for that are complex, extremely unpleasant, and ultimately, I think, speak to the infantilization of artists as business people. So, Simon, I just want to quickly follow up. You, you said a striking thing to me when we were talking about how uh, people are so surprised that you're an artist, but you're interested in money, as if artists are you know, magical puppies that frolic free of uh, <laughs> economic concerns. Um, so I'm, I'm just, you, you also said that it's at this point you almost have to cultivate two practices. Mm -hmm. um, and and can, you, can you share with us a little bit more about uh, those kinds of issues? Yeah, uh, great questions. I mean, you know, I'm a fan of the history of art in lots of different ways, and I think um, artists have been working with uh, financial design for a longer time, uh, certainly uh, since, uh, since conceptual art. Um, there's a great book out there, actually, by Yale uh, University Press called The Artist as Economist, which um, outlines uh, some really great conceptual art projects uh, where, where artists like, for example, Dan Graham was selling um, uh, shares in his, uh, his company very, uh, very early uh, in his own name, uh, for example. And, and th there's many examples uh, for a longer time. So I think artists have always been very aware uh, of the economic environment in which they act, um, and even kind of painters like Gerhard Richter, you know, early... Uh, early examples of um, uh, what was called capitalist realism uh, in the 60s. They did these, uh, they did these very interesting exhibitions, uh, those groups of painters in, in Cologne, uh, looking at the conditions that were, their paintings were being made under. Um, and, but then you have very obvious uh, examples like uh, Andy Warhol, Jeff Koons, uh, many other people who, who kind of work with that. So I think it's a mainstay that artists are, are, are quite literate in these things. Um, and, uh, but yeah, in terms of two different art worlds, uh, I mean, I think I'm, I'm very involved in the museum world and the gallery world. Um, I, I teach at an art school. I, I went to various different art schools as well as a student. Um, so I'm very socialized into the kind of, I guess, like MoMA canon um, style art world. And the NFT art world is a, is a little bit different at this point, like the different actors, different collectors, as you were mentioning um, at Sotheby's, which is very exciting. So it's like a whole new world. But yeah, they also speak slightly different languages at the moment, the kind of like the, the, the lingo and the kind of norms in each, um, each group don't necessarily always meet, which um, I find both interesting and frustrating because you, uh, you know, uh, as somebody who's passionate about both, I like to go into these uh, groups and say, wow, did you see this amazing thing that's happening in this other art world? And they kind of eye roll often and you have to do a little translation of why it's interesting. Um, and uh, that's, that can be fun, but it can also be a bit limiting. Um, and I think probably in the future with all of these uh, people and uh, people in the room here as well, working towards uh, spending attention um, on, on why these things are interesting and maybe shifting attention um, to the things that are doing the most innovative things, which I think is what institutions mm -hmm. do in the, in the traditional art world. Um, and maybe DAOs and uh, special curatorial spaces can do in the, the NFT Web3 art world. Um, then maybe those conversations will come together where literacy is a bit easier. Yeah. So at this moment of evolution, Paula, I'd love to get your thoughts on a, a sort of more literal form of evolution. I first heard about NFTs in relation to the National Basketball Association's Top Shot uh, offer, where uh, you can buy NFT versions of your favorite sports moment. Um, and it, it is, it, it sort of seamlessly fit into a culture of fandom. Um, but the notion of fan versus art collector, mm -hmm. um, I think is one of the things that seems to be very threatening to uh, people as they try and receive and understand what NFTs can, can mean. You, you have such a keen sense of the nature of belonging, of the, the nature of how art generates meaning and communicates. Do you have a thought about the difference between being a fan and being a collector? Uh, that is a, um, 
a, a really difficult line to, to define. Um, and sometimes they overlap. It's like when someone says, are you an artist or a designer, right? That they, they're all come from a creative place. The, the question for me is, what is being created? And in a lot of ways, a lot of things are assets that are being chopped up into little units and uh, you know tokenized. There is so much new, exciting, innovative thought processes that can come through um, this format. But again, I'm always going to ask, what's the, the net value? How are, are we as artists contributing to, to the language, to the ideas, to the canon? I think NFTs are, are an expansive mode to that. I'm just not sure, uh, for, for me personally, where, where that engagement will be. You know, Simon, you talk about something that's really important that over really the existence of art, it's been a disproportionate power position for, for artists. Artists need um, uh, to, to sell their work. Sometimes they need to tailor their work. Um, and in, in NFT world, you also see people now targeting for a specific audience. What's the ram ramification um, of that? It, I think it is a net plus but that now we have a disintermediation mm -hmm. and that artists can more directly go with their content and different kinds of content. So, so it is um, truly expensive. So, so picking up on that, Nicola, what are you seeing in terms of this generational issue around who's interested in an NFT, who's comfortable with it? Is there a an issue of visual literacy of comfort with the digital space? Um, are you hoping NFTs are a gateway drug to a, a bigger kind of more expansive interest <laughs> in art? I think it's very interesting for us. I, I mean, as Simon mentions, you know, I've done a lot of teaching over the years as well. So I think the intergenerational conversation is always something that should be a priority and is a priority for us at the museum. We want to support the whole ecosystem of the art world. Um, I think the most interesting thing that's on my mind at the moment, and I was at the Serpentine for many years in London, and they actually also just did an exhibition in Fortnite, which I think they were saying they had like more million, tens of millions mm -hmm. of people visited the Serpentine online, a virtual Serpentine. But we also always used to do, architecture exhibitions are quite challenging to really translate the excitement of the medium. So we would build these incredible pavilions with architects each year as experiments to show what is possible and, and in, introduce new materials. So I think it really, the intergenerational conversation also needs us to figure out more ways for us to bring the exciting work, for example, that Simon's talking about into the institutions or create a space that sits next to the institution or alongside the institution that really shows the whole um, realm of possibilities. And I think that's something that curators are, are, are wrestling with at the moment of like what is the way for us to invest in really showing this intergenerational conversation because you often see at a dinner party that the conversation sort of collapses in on itself with some excitement and skepticism and, and a complete um, lack of um, translation between the two things. So I think it is gonna be very interesting to see where we can go. And I think as we're excited that this is also gonna bridge a world that's interested in this online space and currency exchange into the contemporary art world as well as bringing a more traditional contemporary art world into the, the sort of crypto space. So it's, it's, it is gonna be interesting and it's completely unknown and I think most of the art world is still very skeptical, particularly of what it would mean to do an exhibition about NFTs and how that could have anything in comparison to the atmosphere and emotions you have in more traditional exhibitions. Uh, that, and that's, that's such an essential point because so much of this is, is about communicating by emotion, not by some linear logic. Are you seeing stress points among curators who traditionally their happy place has been essentially talking to each other? Um, and you know, sort of have it, having the professional reinforcement of a conversation about value is, is part of this issue. Sort of what Nina was describing is that they're the, the intermediators, the validators, um, are maybe having to scramble a little bit. 
I think the conversation sits side by side, and it's interesting. I think Simon, you have also been clear about that. You know, I, I think that the conversation about how we can start commissioning more long-form critical writing, and that's definitely something that Outland is doing. And Outland's this amazing, also commissioning platform for NFTs and, and this space, but also they're starting to commission long-form writing and critique. Um, I think Art Forum, I think I read the first exciting review about an NFT in Art Forum last week, which for me was like, so I think there is an element of that, but it does then prioritize the storytelling context, which Simon's also interested in. I mean, I think, I'm not sure if long form critical writing is really able to translate the more abstract space that we're talking about yet. So if there's a great NFT that tells a clear story, and I think Sarah Friend is a great example of an artist who's also a software engineer and an amazing storyteller. So mm. it will be interesting to see when we can sort of, those two things can catch up with each other. And I think that will also mean that the critical content and the market will also be able to sit side by side. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, go ahead, Simon. I'd also like to make a claim for like, um, like uh, destabilizing this idea that like something about storytelling can't be something with FX. You know, I think there's like a lot of NFT projects that mm. are very emotionally focused and FX focused, and mm. there's also exhibition making that's happened, which is very um, self-consciously been about both the experience in the room and the kind of network design aspects, and you know, have people gasp and and respond very intuitively as well as have things to think about intellectually and, and, and kind of structurally. I think that's already happening in the space. Yeah. And, um, and it's more about, uh, you know, museums doing what they do very well, I think, is like uh, finding those things and then amplifying them within the network of people that love art, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that might not be in those same discovery places. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do in that because there is so much work being made, actually, and they don't always get the, the market boost signal, right? You know, a project like Sarah's, has no value, there's, you can't, you know, so how do you talk about it within that framework? There's never gonna be uh, the, the signal boost of the massive million dollar sale, um, and that's where I think uh, museums have traditionally done an incredibly great job of saying, this is effective, it doesn't have the same market value necessarily as other things that uh, you already are very aware of. Um, so, so yeah, I just wanna make a claim for affect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I wanna pick up on that uh, with something, and, and then we are gonna open up it to, to questions shortly, and I'm gonna, Nicola, put you in the witness protection program for a minute and ask this question <laughs> of Nina about what you are seeing in terms of museums' reaction to NFTs and the market possibilities for them, is this a different form of merch? What's you know what's on the mug, or what what are what are the opportunities here? So this has been a really long and robust conversation that's unfolded, I think, over more than a year. I just want to say, Nicola is in a really important and difficult place and spot, and and the museums I talk to are equally sort of searching for what's the what, what, what position should they take? They're also asking another question, and this, this conversation really started, and it's why I'm here today. I think, you know, 15 months ago, the AAMD, American Association of Museum Directors, asked me and our CEO to come and talk about NFTs. This is at the beginning of the market. And I was on a Zoom call, and I thought, okay, there will be five people who show up, and it was 65 museum directors, and we had a two-hour conversation about okay, do we need to pay attention? Not what will we exhibit, that is a more nuanced question, but should we be creating a revenue opportunity for our institution using NFTs? And what does that mean? What is the spectrum? Can we use works in the collection without deaccessioning those works and create important revenue for the museum? I wanna say this is still an ongoing conversation. I must talk to three museums a week about this. It's, it's important. Museums have almost become creators, and think about it, you could be, I mean, the Uffizi did it. You could create high resolution, Im resolution images of works from the collection at the risk of offending the Uffizi. What is the difference between that and the mug that you're selling in your coffee shop? It's very reproductive as something that you're gonna, it's a reproduction as something that you're going to sell out into the universe. And so museums have really started thinking about partnering with artists bringing content into what they do, I think equally as important, creating communities that they don't touch. So as I talk about kind of a younger demographic, a different audience that we're talking to, when we sell NFTs, and again, the, the ideal is to merge the traditional and the sort of new audience, but for the museum, not only 
is selling an NFT an opportunity to create revenue and remember, participate in that sale and resale in perpetuity, but it's also to think about opening their own institutions up to a larger group of people, maybe being less that house on the hill, and you can imagine the encyclopedic institutions I'm talking to, and speak to people in a different way, create membership benefits. I'm getting the warning here, so I will stop, but it's, it's, it's really a long and kind of, I think, valuable prospect. So uh, collector as fan, participant as fan, Paula? So, so uh, I'm on the board of MoMA, and we uh, did a project with Rafiki six Central. months ago. Um, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a tricky line, once again, because did we as a museum give Rafiki cred? So then, therefore, that gave him an initial boost in the, in the marketplace. And we've done this in a place where there has been a cur curatorial um, point of view. Uh, it's actually done uh, fairly well, but it's, um, it, it's a conflict of interest that we have to think about. I'm all for other income streams for uh, museums and creative ways of expanding audiences. But it's, um, it needs to be done thoughtfully. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to open it up to questions now. If folks could, uh, we've got one mic coming right here. Lori? Hi, uh, Lori Tisch from New York. Um, so Nina, you and I touched on this a little bit last night. Um, I want to preface it by saying I'm very pro-artist. I chaired the Whitney. I have a foundation that supports artists. Um, I, have, I am a collector. Um, the reason I prefaced it by that, uh, with that is because Nina and I spoke a little bit last night about um, if artists should continue, I guess it's mostly living artists, should continue um, to get paid as you know, things are sold, resold, resold um, at Sotheby's, other places, you know, for higher and higher dollars. And even though I'm so committed to artists in so many different ways, I said, I actually have mixed feelings about it um, because I wonder, wouldn't the same uh, be true of architects or you know, a house is sold for $2 million and then it's sold for $10 million or a jeweler who sold a piece of jewelry for 25000 and then it's sold at Sotheby's for a $1 million. Um, so my question, sorry for the long preamble, but my question is, um, should artists continue you know, to make profits, 5%, 10%. And what is that, and where would then other artisans, artists like architects, like jewelers, like furniture makers, would it then be fair for them not to also participate in that market? Long question. Simon, you wanna start with that one? <laughs> I mean, I have a very simple answer for that. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, architects can use the infrastructure of the blockchain as well, and so can jewelers. Mm -hmm. And I think right. the idea is rather not to uh, move down and restrict <laughs> artists from uh, receiving the uh, resale revenue, um, but rather to open up to more genres. I mean, you know, an NFT or, or a blockchain infrastructure is essentially an asset design, right? So you can, you can apply it. I mean, I heard a, a punk owner um, say uh, that, um, that NFTs are rails for intangible assets. You know, and I think that's a, you know, that, 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 that's a really good way of, of thinking of it. And also, I just want to remind you that like five, ten percent um, uh, is also not as much as the reseller is getting, which is like ninety, whatever percent. So I, I think I think those people who are creating those things should get more. I, I know many artists at many stages of their lives, many architects, many composers uh, at many stages of their lives. Mostly, they're a lot more economically challenged than the people that support their work. Mm -hmm. So I think any kind of infrastructure that can do something to support uh, the creator more is a, is a, is a positive. Great. Um, you and then, I'm sorry, uh, if, if uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. If we have the next break. Thank you. So I'm involved in blockchain applications in the music industry. and. Uh, for all the hype, we have the idea that NFT activity in the music industry is actually a rounding error uh, in terms of revenue, uh, just if you put aside all the hype. And so I'm really interested in knowing how that compares to the visual art market in terms of the revenue percentage, let's say, of the overall activity in the market. Nina shouted out a couple figures, but I'd love to know more about that because we have this perception that 
we're just a tiny little, music is, is a tiny little thing, and all the real action is in the visual art market. <laughs> so are, am I right or wrong about that? So I, I'm gonna sort of pivot you a little bit and say the, the way that we use blockchain technology, and you may be creating NFTs and, and creating a revenue stream for your own business from this, but the way that we use blockchain technology and how it can be used in the future kind of doesn't have a whole lot to do with the NFT as the actual object. So once you start to think about what could you do with this, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm listening to, to uh, you know, everyone on the panel and really thinking to myself, it's not about the NFT, it's not about the piece of music, it's about how you do the transaction and bringing the control back to the person, the, the creator. I hear Lori's point and I was like, please bring this up as a question, it's so important. But here's what we are thinking now, like imagine every visual work of art that had a smart contract associated with that transaction so that every single seller, every single museum who deaccessions, every single artist, then they participate in the ongoing re resale, that royalty could change the music business as well. So it's just turning this on its head. There is a huge potential for the marketplace in general, and I'm sorry to, to continually come back to the market, but this is where a lot of this lives. So it's not about the NFT, it's about that resale potential, that royalty potential that can really, I think, change all of these markets. Yeah, and it's early, right? It's I mean, super it's like, early. It's like the internet in 1995 or whatever. So of course, like Amazon sales per book sales, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. You, sir. Um, my understanding is in the art world that provenance is always a huge issue. And I would think that tokenization solves that problem to a very huge degree, and maybe you want to speak about that. Do you want to start, and then Nicola, um, Paula? This is huge. So in fact, Sotheby's four or five years ago bought technology, which is called Mira, out of Stanford, which is all it is is a super high resolution imaging machine because we recognized, makes us sound super smart, we just saw this, this window, um, we recognized the potential to record like a thumbprint of a work of art, authorship, provenance, an old master painting, a new work being created. When I look at that, I think every artist should be recording that thumbprint in the form of an NFT, which is the unique identifier for their art. That is like changing the title, the real estate, you know, the, the title that you have on your house and the insurance you need to take out for it and the title searches that you need to do. Imagine that in the art world where we struggle with every Giacometti that we sell has to be authentic, sent to Paris, authenticated by the foundation. Oh my gosh, if you sell a Mendigliani, you go into a sort of spiritual psychic angst because it's so hard to authenticate these works. This mitigates this issue enormously, so I'm right with you. Yeah. I just wanted to ask Nicholas, since you guys just did an Andy Warhol show, and the Warhol Foundation famously stopped authenticating his works a number of years ago because they just couldn't. Um, how was that experience for you? I think it's very interesting, but in some ways my mind went to an artist called Stephen Willits, who's a British artist who's very interested in systems and maybe even in a pre internet era and in the 70s, there's lots of artists also in the 70s and 80s who made work that was almost, they didn't sign their works, you know, they didn't sort of participate in that system as well. So I think I'm interested also in, there is also some space still in the NFT world where I'm not sure if everyone wants, you know, there'll be other ways for the system to also not necessarily make everything transparent. Is that, Simon, you like? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a real tension in the in the blockchain world in general between transparency and ob, and like ob, ob, obfuscation or something like that, right? There's like wallet to wallet, there's transparency, but who owns those wallets is often pseudonymous and, and et cetera. So I think I think those worlds are creatively very interesting to work with, um, uh, but also obviously there's a lot of work to be done on on figuring that out outside of art as well. I mean, from the artist standpoint, it's your IP and the idea that you can have that certified and follow that through uh, transactions or life, uh, that, that's really important. So we are unfortunately out of time. I do wanna end with something uh, striking that Nicola said to me when we were speaking, which was a lot of our values have been constructed by systems we need to keep questioning. Uh, and perhaps as we continue the conversation uh, beyond today, 
that's uh, a, a key value uh, to affirm. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kate.